hello everyone still alive after this whole day of pitches uh, thank you for being here i'm really pleased to uh, be on stage today for this uh, let's say closing panel of uh, innovation day medium lab day with a, a crazy uh, bunch of people around here and that uh, i will let introduce themselves uh, in a few minutes but uh I'm Yvan Boudier, I'm uh, the founder of uh, The Link, uh, an advisory uh, agency connecting the dots between startups and the music industry. First of all, I would like to know who, who you are a little bit, so we know how can we interact, and we, we are going to have a Q&A session at the end. So who, who in the room is from a label or, let's say, recording music? Artist? Good. Oh, you're both, I know you. Startup? Uh, VC? No. So sorry, you're not going to raise any money today. <laughs> um, what else? Publishing? No. And it says there is many other players in the around. But so uh, today we're going to tackle the question or the topic of innovation with uh, different perspective from uh, our panelists, and really we have. It, you had, I think you have the chance today to see great startups exploring and inventing new ways to create, share, discover, monetize, experience music. And what we're going to discuss today is how to articulate this, all this innovation with uh, the reality of the music industry or usage or market, whatever. But what does it mean in terms of uh, disruption or solution? what is your appropriate angle, but to answer that, first I will ask the panel to introduce themselves quickly, who you are, your company, your mission, the mission, and then we'll start the, the conversation. Claudia, ladies first. Claudia, I am a co-founder of Music Tech Germany with the world's first and still only federal association of music tech. Um, also the co-founder of a company called Wicked Work. Uh, we're a creative tech um, consultancy. And uh, I am uh, my expertise is in um, AI, blockchain, immersive media, spatial sound, uh, and all of the applications that come with that. Um, and we also co found I also co-founded um, a series of events called Music Unchained, uh, which is a monothematic sort of conference format. Great. Uh, Sean? All right. I'm uh, Sean Wilson. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Mazooka. Uh, we do two things. We're an asset management utility. And what that means is Artists and their teams can organize their images, you know, videos, social assets inside of most of the major ticketing companies um, around the world, radio networks, festivals, back-end utilities, et cetera. And as a byproduct of all the data that we capture, um, we can confirm when and where live performances happen. So we work with PROs, collecting societies, uh, globally to help distribute um, live performance dollars. And we allow artists to submit their set lists. And I also happen to be uh, an active uh, tech investor as well. Good, Phil. Hi, everybody. I'm Phil Barry, founder of Blocker. Blocker is a blockchain-based platform for creative rights management with a first focus on music. And we work with music publishers, record labels, performers, and songwriters to ensure that their rights are accurately represented out there in the world so that when their music is played, then they get paid. Um, and for the first part of my career, I was an artist, spent almost a decade doing that and running a small independent record company that I founded. And so the mission of the company is all about improving life for creators and the creative world, um, and explicitly to um, complete the potential of the internet for the creator. I'm excited to be here and see what transpires. Sounds good. John. <clears throat> Afternoon, everyone. I'm John Eads. Uh, I'm the co-founder and director of a new business in London called The Rattle, uh, which is best described as a combination of a few things. It's part incubator, part co-working space, part studio facility, um, and part members club, I guess. Uh, members pay a flat fee and get access to uh, everything they need to build their business, essentially. Uh, before that, so I joined that about three months ago. Before that, I spent about eight years at Abbey Road Studios, where I set up Abbey Road Red, which is a music tech incubator run out of the studios. Uh, and I handed that over to my good friend Kareem, who's sitting at the back, so it's in safe hands. Good. Andre. 
My name is André Manoukian. I am French. I am musician. I was, uh, and I'm a co-founder of a startup called Music. Uh, in terms of Muse, the new Muse of music. I'm. Uh, we are uh, generating. Uh, music in an automatic way but we we don't like music uh, generated by robots so we do augmented composer uh, my main activity is I'm a composer so I don't want to ruin the composer work so uh, the 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 copyrights are very important for us what we did with i mean we we invented a process uh, you it's like the michelangelo process you get a musician and then you get assistant you you compose a track and then a tune and then we put this in our machine and we can generate like 100 or 150 are uh, different arrangements from one composition so what we what we do is we augment a composer and, and it's uh, in the purpose to do uh, synchro music to do music uh, movie and to do of course to be on the on the video streaming and all the music that we will need soon because they not they are not uh, so much aware of the musical problem on the internet so that's a big uh, ambitious uh, plans. It's good. So with a different profile, uh, artists, artist entrepreneurs, uh, places, and agri uh, incubators. First, I think to 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 go to the to the question and to the topic, I would like uh, each of you shortly to to tell what is your definition of innovation, but not too much into a, a theoretic way, but how you approach it in your day to day. Uh, uh, approach uh, as a business or as a player in the in the in the ecosystem. Uh, potentially, John, uh, you first. I don't know why you, but because <laughs> um, yeah, um, oh, it's a really annoying apolitical uh, re response. But it depends on your perspective, and as someone I've felt acutely in my shift from being employed by a major label and uh, sort of running a. Uh, a, an, an initiative around the venture model and then moving to something which is community-based um, where we're not really looking for scalable growth. Um, and so it really depends on where you sit. If you're an investor, you look at it one way. If you're I don't know, a consumer, you look at it a different way. Um, and your commentary is different and you call it disruption or you call it solution or you call it something different uh, depending on where you sit. So that's a, a non-answer. I think it's a good answer to me. Or you can call it transformation if you are like a HR or whatever in an organization way. Feel uh, your approach uh, from your background and what you do with Blocker now. Uh. Yes, I guess um, I don't mind admitting that I was Googling the definition of innovation outside <laughs> before I came on here. Just because I know they all know, so they're all just gonna <laughs> they're just gonna accuse me of it if I if I give something pretentious. But essentially I guess, I guess it's the it's the step between, you know, invention of a new idea and or or technology and turning that into something that's gonna become product or service, which I guess is what most kind of startups are in, that kind of phase. Um, and I suppose our approach really is to zone in quite specifically on big painful problems that seemingly are unsolved and need to be solved that have a lot of need you know people interested in having them having them solved and then basically to iterate around solutions to try and meet to try and meet that challenge and so that's the process that we've been in over, I guess, the last 12 months, especially through, you know, the various iterations of products, you know, through, you know, uh, MVPs and prototypes to, you know, betas and pilots and all the rest of it, you know, it's, it's that process of z zeroing in on what will eventually be, you know, a clearly articul articulated solution to a big problem. Yeah, innovation at work, like uh, not a lean startup meet or whatever, but just experimentation, iteration and make it making shit happens sometimes. Uh, well, actually, I mean, we see a lot of um, a lot of startups that seem to sort of buy into the the work culture and the the hipness of having a startup uh, instead of forget that it's actually innovative ideas should add value to something, to, to a process or to, you know, a routine or whatever, and actually, you know, solve a problem or address a, a 
the challenge or whatever, but a lot of them seem to kind of get lost in that process and kind of just want to, oh, I have this idea, I heard that someone has a problem and someone always, like, a lot of the times it means the girlfriend of my best friend or something and they mentioned, you know, some individual mentioned that they have a problem and that all of a sudden becomes the basis for an idea that turns into a company and then they're calling for Series A funding and it's, it's quite interesting how, how many in percentage, how many of these uh, young entrepreneurs kind of get lost in that, in the sexiness of having a startup and kind of lose side of what's actually the if they have a purpose in what they do so i think yeah so that for me would be the the core of innovation to add value and, and actually uh, solve a problem i will allow to have an extra time for you on on this one because uh, I, I i was part of the the first uh, music and chain initiative in at south by in austin uh, you had this one afternoon or one day dedicated yeah. to blockchain so uh, phil is really part of the also this this our topic but uh it felt i was i was part of the round table uh, in the afternoon and it felt to me that this question of, about replacing or being an alternative to the system and uh, how, how about how to scale that and fixing or improving the existing system by collabor collaborating with uh, existing player was pretty central but not addressed it was like a taboo because i, I raised a question and it was pretty that a lot of the ideas are trying yeah, to replace like, hey, the system. Why do you why do you see it in in terms of this kind of r r red or yellow line? Like, re do you really want to be an alternative or just becomes a new system? Uh, well, I think the startups who set out, um, especially in the music industry, um, you know, and I work with a lot of creative tech, so that goes into all areas of fashion and and that kind of uh, all of this verticals. Um, so a lot of the people kind of. If, if they if they set out to say we're going to replace the system, they clearly don't understand the system because there's no way around the system right now, uh, or in general, and they shouldn't be. And you know, there's a lot of players and a lot of history that that has to be acknowledged and has to be addressed and has to be incorporated in the process of innovation. I think, um, and I mean, this this starts. I mean, obviously, the the the, the most obvious uh, problem is copyright and licensing, and a lot of the companies that we've talked to or that we kind of meet or uh, that approach us kind of, it's it's amazing their lack of interest and their lack of knowledge in those areas, especially when it comes to licensing. And and uh, early in one of the pitches, it was quite funny that, that that was a question and then the person just said, oh, well, we don't, we don't save what we, what the changes we made to the music. We don't save that we delete it. And that was the solution for we don't address the licensing issues. That was kind of interesting. You don't, I don't think, you, you need more to have more conversations in that area. So. Yeah, so I think copyright is one of the major issues for startups, and a lot of them need to really buckle up on learning about this uh, this industry. Yeah, copyrights and transparency, and how to service better. To let's go back to also sometimes to the value chain discussion, and not only like value gap or blockchain. There is something to be built up on that. Uh, you, Sean, I think it's really interesting to also have your vision about also from the live industry perspective because. If you read the press, like uh, across the, ten, the past ten years, like it's pretty clear that music, on the recording side of it, uh, as is known to have been like Uberized or whatever, like disrupted that much. Even if we still see the historic players into the game, but from uh, in the live industry, how do you, how do you approach that, and what, what do you see, like uh, from your perspective, this kind of approach of? Uh, innovation, the definition of it, but also how do you articulate that with uh, the existing player? Sure. Uh, lo a lot of things in this industry, in my opinion, as, as a guy who still sort of fancies himself as a bit of an outsider, because I haven't been in the studio, I haven't worked you know, at Abbey Road, I haven't done all these cool things that a lot of our panelists have done. I think that real innovation comes from you know, simplicity, asking a lot of dumb questions, getting to the core of what those issues are. And when you think about the live music space, there's a lot of moving parts. But at the end of the day, it's people that want to see people on stage kick ass and entertain a crowd. And so when I think about innovation, it's, it's one of those things where um, one, of my, one of my favorite uh, entrepreneurs, um, sadly, I wasn't able to invest in his company, but I encourage everybody to follow him on Twitter as a fellow by the name of Aaron Levy. He started Box.net, and he's one of the most interesting guys on Twitter. He's very good with words. And one of his tweets that we actually used in one of our pitch decks 
said that industries are transformed. And this doesn't necessarily mean that people inside of the industry can't do it, but it, the, the, the quote makes a really good point. Industries are transformed by outsiders who think anything is possible, not insiders who already think what they know is impossible. And so sometimes it's just breaking that down and really asking those questions and finding ways of creating simplicity and, you know, doing things to make that process easier. So I think in the live space, and I even think, you know, in, in my life as an investor in companies, you know, we're always interested in finding entrepreneurs that are solving problems that no one's executed on before, not people that are coming in and trying to make incremental improvements on things that, you know, are already there. And so that's, you know, as it relates to live, it's just, there's a lot of overcomplication. We see that in a lot of tech startups. We were at Canadian Music Week and we were involved in the hackathon and just people solving problems that have already been solved before or just doing things that are overly complicated. Yeah, really good point. And I think, yeah, your, the VC point of view, we don't have like uh, operating VCs right now on the, on the panel with us, but uh, I, I, I did several travels to, to the Valley, to San Francisco, and out there it's pretty obvious that this idea of disruption and operating, not, not only thinking, but operating out of the box, yeah. like even being outlaws, like thinking be, beyond the rules, yeah. is the rule. Yeah. Because you need to invest in something that is bigger than the existing market, even in, in term, even of valuation. Like Airbnb, Uber are illegal, so to speak, in terms of the sure. existing laws. But in the music industry, it's a different game so far. Even if like Deezer, when they started, they were not that legal. And they, they went to talk to the labels, and now they are part of the ecosystem. Sure. So I think it's, it's interesting to have both, uh, both perspectives. You, Andre, uh, because your, your perspective, what you do as an artist, as also a music lover, and the entre an entrepreneur developing music in this kind of also hot topic of AI music, uh, generative music or composition, how do you see this innovation principle? Because music and innovation is not a story that starts now. It's like a long, a long way to to what we are now. I've seen I've seen it <laughs> from the ancient ancient ages. I've been lucky to record in a Bay Road studio to be to do a, as a composer of music. But I was a member of uh, of the jury of uh, French Idol. You know what it uh, you know what it means. It was called Nouvelle Star. Here I've been this I've been doing this for twelve years. We started in two thousand two, I guess, and we finished like two years ago. And I noticed that on the first contestant, the first singer uh, in the beginning of the twenty first century, so. Their singing was awful. All the guys wanted to sing like uh, Laurent Pagny, and all the girls wanted to sing like Céline Dion. And it was uh, it was very funny. That was the principle of it. And then twelve years after, it's like we. I mean, we are in France. We all always try to copy Anglo-Saxon music, you know. But when the records, when the American record or the English record were were on the market, on the French market, they have been, they were uh, produced like five years ago. So we were always running as musicians with a with a five-year delay, approximately. And then I saw the internet, and I saw what it brought what it produced, uh, young guys, 16 years old, singing like Otis Redding, for example, because they were choosing for the first time of their life. Music is not is no more linear. You can choose your time, you can choose your country, and then you can develop here your own style. And I was seeing like two years ago, guy, little guys uh, from the suburbs singing with, with that flavor, with the old Motown stuff. And I was thinking to myself, Okay, now the French have been uh, get uh, are getting rid of this delay, this artistic delay. So that's a very good thing of internet. Uh, it makes improve creativity. Creativity. It in a way it changed the rules, but in the way of the creativity, it's like it was never done before. And uh, I'm a musician as well, and I like to. The, the transmission when I was young, I had to go to the Berkeley School of Music because 
the jazz was not teached in France. And now you, you get tutorials and you get all those musicians coming out. And if you ask to the music school, the level is just incredible. So as a musician, I can testify that maybe it's like a, we had a big economist called Jacques Attali who did a prophecy. He was saying, in the future, nobody will buy music, but everybody will be able to produce their own music. And I guess we are approaching this. Very interesting point. Andre, you point something out uh, which is really tied to uh, consumer or usage or adoption. Because I, I guess if you take the history of music, when I was working at EMI, EMI back in the days was a manufacturing company, like pressing vinyls. And innovation to me was, was ringing as uh, research and development, like uh, researcher in a lab, doing technical stuff. But nowadays, I think when I, when has been pursued from an industry perspective was innovation was also user taking control. Like, like hey, guys, uh, I want to choose my music. I want to do my own stuff. I want to potentially be also famous. But uh, how do you see that also in, in your different uh, perspective? Because... How do you incorporate that in your approach, uh, this kind of bottom-up approach of innovation? Uh, I don't know, like making users using it better, better? Like, because I don't know if it is if it's something you can talk about from the different angle. You, you, but potentially you, Andre, how do you get? Because you, you mentioned you are working with real music. How do you get artists to be on board with this kind of disruption approach you got? So uh, as as I say, we help the composer to 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 multiply their arrangements. So we give we are giving them new tools. Uh, as soon as you finish your composition, you are on a Logic Audio, Pro Tools, or whatever, and then you get this magic button, and then pew, you get a a, a new sound. Uh, I, I was concerned uh, about this problem because when you do, when you write music to uh, to to movies. Uh, the editor is always saying, okay, or even to publicity, to advertising, your music is nice, but maybe a little bit more blue, maybe a little bit more red, maybe. So you get this button. But uh, beyond that, uh, for me, uh, I think that uh, the in inventor of AI in music is called uh, Johann Sebastian Bach. Uh, he was uh, in, the, in his art of fugue. The art of fugue is just a way to teach how to do a fugue with a little theme. So I'm concerned about jazz, I'm concerned about classical, and so we invented the stuff as well, or you play randomly four or five notes, and then you press on a button, and then you see your partition, and then we can develop your notes like Jean-Sébastien Bach fugue, or like a Chopin sonata, or and even if you are not a musician, so you can you can see what is a principle because you get the you you see your your note here, and then the the problem of the fugue you transpose it a fifth up and then a fourth down, and so even for a kid uh, by playing random notes you can have access to what is happening in the mind of a composer. So I'm concerned about those two things. Help the composer, help the musician, give them more tools to be more creative, and then in a pedagogic way. Because when I was a kid, I wanted to improvise, and when I was seeing some jazz men, they could only say to me, have some whiskey. So we, we got other stuff now than this as have some whiskey to, to improve your playing. I think that's quite an interesting point that Andre is making, um, that music tech should be understood as empowerment of artists and their support systems and not as an enemy. So as to your question, whether to improve or replace, you know, I'm clearly on the side of not even improve, but just, you know, empower people in that industry or in the community, in the creative community to use all these different tools. And this is specifically applies to AI, which I know a lot of people are fear mongering, you know, uh, publicly uh, that it's, it's going to replace all the artists and all the creators where in fact it could be an empowerment tool and used as such. Uh, and that not only goes to the creation process, the music making process, but also to marketing and what have you. So I think, you know, that's an important 
point, at least in, in my work or in the work that we do as, as music tech or the other companies that I have, is to, to try to bridge the knowledge gap between the people from the more traditional music industry and the music tech industry that, you know, to understand each other better and understand that it's not an enemy. You know, it, it can actually help to make the processes smoother and, and create, you know, help creation. In this theme of uh, empowering, sorry, uh using innovation and internet or data or whatever as a tool to to give more leverage or and power to to the artist or to how do you organize that like at the rattle how do you make the connection but what is there any methodology to make it happen in a in a good way or effective way or if is it, if this is still an ongoing process but can you share that because um. there is still some kind of uh, distance between the, the two sides of the tech and artistic world, but potentially less than we think? Uh, yeah, I mean, there are definitely best practices that you can try and follow, um, but it's pretty much chaotically random, as far as I can tell, um, especially at such an early stage. The, the factors which have to combine to mean that something's successful are multiple and confusing and very difficult to try and plot. Um, so our approach is just to stick everyone in a room and see what happens, basically. And you can you just don't know. Um, and having now watched businesses go from birth to sometimes unfortunate death or great success, it always surprises you which ones come out in which direction at the other end. And I'm not saying there's no skill in picking winners, but uh, especially at the very early stage, it's Mostly just chaos. Ah, pretty, uh, <laughs> it's like putting uh, Elton John and John Lennon in a studio, right? I think it's it's back in the music roots too. Yeah? But you uh, feel like you thought about that, like because on the blockchain uh, thing, uh, how do you try you to to make the, the company you work with to embrace it or make it like something tangible for them or the, the ongoing process? Yeah, I, th I actually think John makes a good point because all the evidence is that for all the design thinking workshops you do and everything else, people invent brilliant things just by mistake because they think it's fun. So actually, it's quite difficult to. I know that we'd love to say there's a startup science and a, a, all of that, but uh, but but I agree. Like there's a, there's a lot of randomness, and that's why, by the way, VCs are lucky because they have a portfolio of random chance. As an <laughs> entrepreneur, you've kind of got you've got one go. But nonetheless, we do our absolute best to increase our chances, and so um, we're a B two B. Um, product, so it's slightly different in sort of a slightly smaller ecosystem, but nonetheless, I guess what you have there is kind of a balance when you go into a meeting with somebody where you kind of you're spending as much of the time as possible listening, um, as much as you want to persuade them that you know what you're talking about. You're also trying to get information out of them all of the time so that you can go back and build it into your product and, and do all of this. And we also do do other things that we do. We actually do actively do workshops with customers, for example, get them to reveal um, reveal what their problems are, what their what their ideas are for solutions. And in some cases, you know we managed to persuade them to pitch them to us so then we get, we get their pictures of what we should be building um, and that's that's quite good as well and I do think it's important um, I hope this is not too far off topic but I just want to say something else that was um, building on, on what was said over here which is I think that you know the sort of the internet and all of the other stuff going on creativity and linking that to a theme from earlier which is that we as startups we're not kind of innovating in some total vacuum or bubble that's dislocated from the rest of the world. And actually, when you're looking at the music industry today, you're not looking at kind of just a solid block that is not moving. There's already a whole lot of different factors that are budging different pieces of it in different directions and putting it into a new structure whether that be changes in copyright reform in, in Europe, whether that be the Music Modernization Act in America, whether that be the fact that PRS has gone from processing in the UK 130 billion uses of music to 6 trillion uses of music within five years, um, whether it's the different ways that people are creating music. So we're talking about transforming an industry. The in industry is transforming on its own, you know, and you kind of have to kind of try and navigate your way through all of these puzzle pieces of the puzzle being thrown up in the air and you're trying to, you know, be the one that's going to see where they're going to land and, and exploit that to some extent. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean... It, <laughs> One of the things, if you're building a startup in this industry, even if you're in the industry, still assume you don't know what you're doing and ask a lot of dumb questions. And as you said, be a really good listener. 
um, one of our core things that we do as a company on the asset management side was not an idea that we came up with. It was literally somebody at Lollapalooza that was like, hey, uh, what if you could do this? And so that's really what built the foundation for our business. So I couldn't agree with that more. And Claudia, you are with uh, your federation, which is pretty unique, as you said. Uh, what is the kind of initiative you you, you have or like uh, some concrete example of uh, the kind of connections you can draw between the startups you are in your federation and let's say the industry, like the traditional players, uh, how the connection works, in which form, and well, I mean, it's it's not rocket science. It's basically doing what Phil is describing, Rich on. You know, it's it's really just getting the different players into a room or in you know different formats, whatever, and really exchange ideas and what are the pain points? You know, what do you what's the idea that you're trying to develop? How does this fit with the problems that we might have or not have? And really just kind of coexist and kind of co-develop. Um, uh, the idea that's that's in the room of, of several startups. So we kind of bring together uh, industry professionals from the, as I call them, the like, traditional music industry and startups and then artists and creators and developers and bring them into a room or a conference or other formats, curated networking, whatever. Um, and then just really sort of initiate um, the exchange, uh, knowledge transfer and you know just kind of lay it on the table and kind of tell, you know, show that both sides are interested in the dialogue and it's needed, you know, uh, and I agree that, that the industry is transforming on its own, but it's definitely, um, there is still a lot of, work, <laughs> I don't want to say work to be done, but I mean, it's, it's really, there's just a lot of communication that is, that needs to happen to really make this a sort of an ecosystem and go away from the ecosystems that we had. So applying the same method that the one you are talking about, asking dumb questions about the problem. If we take the innovation and the, not to change management, we, we, are, we are, but what are the, the, the requisite, like the, the, what needs to be done to go, to, to go further, to, to push it to the next level in terms of, uh, I don't know, financing, regulation, education, whatever. What, what do we need uh, <coughs> jointly to make it not a better world? But more effective to get more projects, more experimentation uh, on the ground. Uh, what are the friction, like if all the pain points nowadays that can be fixed? Anyone? Um, I mean, to try and stitch together a few different bits of this conversation. Um, it, I guess my the, the counter question that I always ask in these kind of conversations is, um, what point are we trying to arrive towards? Because um, to pick up on what Claudia said earlier, um, startups are seen as quite sexy and it's, it's quite a, a sort of a fun environment to work in and you get entrepreneurs. I've heard that, that mm -hmm. term being used. Um, but it's very difficult to know, especially at the beginning, what the net impact of a technological shift or a new business uh, creation is going, going to be. Um, and it's difficult because yeah, there's all this mystery and all this reverence around the startup world, um, but they're not always doing good, um, and not all change is good. Um, and sometimes you think, well, just everyone just back off. Everything's kind of cool as it is. But uh, what drives the the desire for change is uh, well, there's a few key things. One is selfish desire for um, investment return. Uh, that is always going to be there. People are going to want things to change because they want to grow a business, they want to steal someone else's market. Um, and we just get itchy and we're competitive people. Um, and so there's always going to be change. It's just very difficult to know where it's going to land in the end. Um, and inevitably there's casualties on one side where there's winners on the other. I mean, Uber's the obvious example of that. Anyone else? Well, as I say, it's a, it's a, I think that's a fair point. I think that um, there is something of a religion around, you know, startups and venture capital and innovation and everything else. Um, and you will hear people I, I, watching a TV documentary about Silicon Valley in which a very famous investor was talking to a journalist. And the journalist said, well, what happens if people's jobs are lost here? And the guy goes, I'm just concerned that you just don't believe in the future and you're not <laughs> blindly following the future like all of us. I think it is true that, the you know, new is not always better. That said, I do think we need to create as many as opportunity, many as many opportunities as we can to create new ideas that will be beneficial. So, I don't see that we. Sh I think we should try and encourage innovation and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, and as for how we could do that, I mean, I, d I mean, I don't sort of generally put the onus on 
the music industry because they they're your customers right and you've it's not that you have some god given right to, to be taken seriously and be you know given money and everything else you know you have to earn it and demonstrate that you're doing something that has value that is useful in some way and i think that's the job of the startup really to do that um and obviously we can do things with sandboxes and apis and all of these kind of things that would make reduce some friction but i think um you should also look in the mirror and ask you know whether the reason they're saying no is because you know you haven't got something that is valuable you know and that's the job that's your job as a startup is to achieve that I'm going to go in again. Yeah, go ahead. Um, but like where, where I'm at now uh, at the Rattle, we've got the interests of artists very much squarely in our, uh, in our view. And I think that is something that should be encouraged. Um, when you talk about the music industry, it's this whole series of different organizations and businesses built around creative people generally. Um, and we're all just taking little pieces of other people's money or other people's returns off of other people's uh, sort of good product. Um, and I think, uh, generally speaking, if a change is to the benefit of artists, then I think we can all c consider that to be positive. And so I would genuinely encourage, and I'm, if anyone's not seen me speak on a panel before, I try and be as provocative as possible, in case you hadn't noticed. But I do think that is... Uh, something that should be generally encouraged, pushing people towards creating innovative change uh, which benefits the creative artist. Just, yeah, two, just two words, just to say that, you know, and I think that anyway, if you're building a startup, um, and certainly we try and do this at Blocker, but I think if you're going to be successful, you have to ultimately have a big goal to aim at. You have to have a, a mission. And if you don't have that, you're probably going to lose either energy or something along the way. Um, and in our case, it specifically sets out that the mission is to, to improve things for creators. Um, and I think that... If you don't believe in what you're doing, whether it's that or something else, actually, it's quite difficult to, to succeed anyway, that's what I would say. I, I think if you look at the history of companies that have started in this space, I think it's paramount that you have some net benefit to artists and songwriters, eventually. Yeah, it, may, it may not be immediately out of the gate, but if you look at some of the companies that have had success and weren't doing that, eventually, you know, things didn't go well. Uh, I, I will do, yeah. Saying that... Uh, in many panels I've been attended or speaking uh, to, uh, we talk about the artist's desire or what can benefit to, to, to be, can be beneficial to artists, we, but we rarely ask them what they think about it. <laughs> so, Andre, we are also a musician. Can you tell us, like, I guess, like, oh, the, the past 15 years, like, digital, not talking about innovation, so to speak, but it has been quite challenging like like a, a roller coaster from and it's still pretty f even if it is new opportunities and we are back to let's say growth or positive like hey dealing with data dealing uh, how do you feel about that like from an artist perspective of all of these crazy things happening and your community around you like how do you feel your your peers S some artists uh, understood very well uh, the the new game the the guys who do rap, come on, the rapper, the rapper, yeah, the rappers, the rappers, e yeah, <laughs> they've been understanding the, this very well. So they know how to 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 they know how to deal with it. I, uh, I met a lawyer like two one year ago, and uh, she was a very good lawyer in terms of musical rights and all this. And then I hadn't seen her for, I guess, 20 years or something like this. And I said, so how are you doing? I guess that's much, that must be terrible for you. And she said, I never made my, uh, uh, this amount of money. That's crazy. What? And she what? She was working only w with rappers, and she was explaining to me how they were doing this. So they organize, they they do a lot of videos. So they got the money, I don't know from where. <laughs> the bad, okay. So let's forget it. So they organized themselves to 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 do a rap record just three days in a studio, you know. So they, and she was telling me every. Two weeks, a new track. Every two weeks, a new track, a new video, and then suddenly, and they know how to do to get this. Uh, I mean, 
this amount of you, which is a little bit like, uh, I mean, so they know all the tricks of this. Of this. And now uh, they are strong like uh, maybe an industry. And, and this lawyer was telling to me, even for the concerts, uh, they, they were they were obtaining all the money from the producers. So if you know the game and if you know the rule and if you go inside, you can be, of course, creative, even in terms of business. Now, everybody knows that the 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 the, the a and r of the labels they when you go to with your with your with a demo they just look how many views you get on internet on facebook or google you know so that's uh, part of the game so all the work it in a way it's like in the good days of uh, um with the English uh, record label. In France, we never had strong alternative labels. The, the, the bands were developing themselves in independent labels, and then they were growing, and then the major were buying them. That's the same, exactly the same stuff now. Uh, independent label, it makes you, you go on your own on internet, you do your own videos, you, 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 you buy package, uh, from, you buy a views uh, I mean with the guys who know how to buy to make you views and then you organize a little business and then it must it, 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 with by chance you can hit uh, the labels but I, I think all these topics uh, will continue at the same simply uh, the the, organi the organization is changing the big major of tomorrow there are it, it, obviously it's Google and Facebook I mean the the big majors now that will just have their catalog and the more it will it will go uh, uh, it's like when uh, the story of a diligence and the story of the car uh, no uh, no constructor of a diligence uh, co constructed a car that that was the same thing but it was two things too much to to different maybe it will change maybe there of course there are bridge i've got a lot of friends still in labels they are doing a fantastic job etc but we are expecting everybody's uh, what, what i can say is in terms of creativity that's cool in terms of business i'm way i, I wait a lot of uh, about the blockchains and all this yeah i think we're gonna keep some time for sorry for, for q a and there is so many other uh, some direction we can take, like we could have talked about uh, artist entrepreneur, like get rid of the middleman, this kind of thing, D2F, uh, innovation uh, available for an artist to be unparalleled at this level and and what does it mean in terms of value chain and, but please, uh, any question in the audience? So we have 10 minutes to go before closing this panel. Let me just add one oh, thing while ahead. people are thinking of their questions and maybe the microphones are being set up. I don't know. Um, one of the things that I think the beauty of technology is that um, we can actually address markets that we weren't able to address as specifically as we were before. And I think a lot of the startups could have always aimed for the you know the highest the highest scalability and the you know the the big market and you know the big audience. And I think what's the beauty is really that there are so many little markets and you know. Um, Creativity aside from the long tail, um, um, that sorry, um, that you know all of those can be addressed. And and for instance, we're um, very active in the field of music technology and health. So a lot of the pe a lot of people can be, you know, uh, music technology can help a lot of people sort of uh, you know open up their world again after an accident or maybe they're physically challenged um, at birth. So music tech can help in those areas as well and really widen their audience. And I think, you know, it, it doesn't always have to be the big audience, but it can be, you know, the the small the small band from Poland that's all of a sudden big in Canada or, you know, gets an audience in Canada. And then, you know, we have you know, autistic children who learn how to cope with their environment through music tech and VR and all of those things. So I think there's a the beauty in that, and it's not, you know, maybe it's a different approach and it's not as scalable, but, you know, it should be something worth considering as a, a VC to invest in those ideas that go beyond the actual return of investment. And one of the things that we could do to help, and that's a project we're working on, and we hope that Yvonne is uh, joining us, um, 
We're working on a uh, blanket global license for music for startups um, to help with the licensing process and, you know, to sort of shorten um, the time frame in which people are trying to get the right contacts and to get licensing off the ground, yeah. actually afford licensing. And that would help startups to kind of, you know, have a proof of concept phase for their ideas without going through the trouble of, you know, approaching all of the players in the different industry. So AIM is doing that in the UK and they're making headway and we're trying to bring together different national chapters, um, mostly in Europe right now, we're talking to the US and hopefully Canada at some point, um, to bring that together and kind of form a pan-European framework that would enable startups to draw on a catalog that's pre-licensed and affordable. And as they grow as a startup and as an idea, um, they would go to different stages of licensing fees. But that would actually, that would be yeah. one practical thing to help startups get off the ground and really try to find out if their idea has some merit or not. I guess it makes sense, like uh, <coughs> open innovation done the, the right way, but it's not only accessing the data, the catalog, because APIs are already out there, Spotify and so on. I guess it's more about connecting the people who make it happen. And it's about culture and it's about education, so to speak, like, like the people. Because it's, at the end of the day, it's going to be people working with people, with machine allowing <laughs> the relationship to be faster and AI to make it like huge but I guess this is my vision but I appreciate the initiative and I you know that um, <laughs> I'm an advocate of all that kind of stuff uh, please seven minutes uh, to have questions <laughs> before we get the names of the happy winners of this medium front lab. row right there Go. Thank you. <laughs> So I'm really pleased to hear what you just said, because I have a startup that has been struggling with music licensing for 18 months, despite severe interest from the majors. I'm not, I'm not sure it's a question so much as a, a request, but I, I think it's really important that when you try and negotiate that sandbox, that it's for all new media, now known or otherwise unknown. Because if it's, if it's for existing media, then we're not helping innovation. Yeah. We're just helping people disrupt an existing industry. And, and if we try and bring something that doesn't exist into fruition, then you still get bogged down in, in the, the business affairs and legal bolt hole that is just painful to navigate. And, and it, honestly, it's the most painful thing I've ever been through in my life. But, but that, that would be my, my request to you, is that oh, we say yeah. for all, uh, all future media that is not, doesn't exist right well, now. Well, that's, that's actually quite the, the most difficult point that we're facing right now, to actually explain to rights holders what that could be, because it's it's always easier if you have, you know, even if you have a pitch deck or, you know, ready to go product, you know, you can explain what that does. But if you talk about, um, you know, what could what could be, you know, they've they've always been reluctant to, to write a sort of a blank field in their contract. So that's that's the biggest challenge we're facing. But we have some good partners um, so far, at least I can speak for Germany for, for now. Um, that are trying to understand and are more open and, and so we're heading in the right direction. So yes, so definitely. Excellent. Uh, well, I'll give you a perfect example just anecdotally that I spent probably 80 hours in a room with various departments of one major label and thought we were at contract and before one person that had been in almost all those meetings went, hang on a minute, they get a download? <laughs> oh, I'm not sure about that. And I was like, we've been in 80 hours of meetings, so yeah, of course they get down. So it, like, unless people are willing to accept the fact that that sandbox needs to accept yeah future innovations we can't conceive of right now. Then. Well, I, I think we all have these war stories. I'm a music supervisor for TV and film mostly in, um, in my second life. <laughs> and, um, and I've had, uh, I wanted to sync uh, a track for a game and I was talking to one of the majors, I'm not going to name who, and they were like, well, we've not, and, and people were scrambling in the sync department, the legal department, because they've never done that for a game. And I'm like, this cannot be happening in 2016. I think it was two years ago. This is just ridiculous that that has never come up. So all the, you know, un, uh, sort of unused, untapped opportunities to sync and do whatever with, with the catalog, you know, it's just, it's just mind blowing how, how many opportunities there are and how many block roads they are to get there. If you don't have patience, this isn't the good industry yeah. to get into. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, no. Well, it's, yeah, it, no, very, very true. Well, your investors have to have patience. Yeah, yeah but good point trying to look at innovation as inventing the future. So it's, it means uh, long-term vision, long-term objective, long-term p &L. Ooh. <laughs> so the end co common vision sometimes, but uh, good, good point. And, and, uh, 
This really goes for VCs too, though, or for any type of investors. And I'm not looking at you, but you're probably different. But um, a lot of them kind of look at the same scalability of tech startups that they would in, in sort of out in the open field and not specifically for creative tech. And it's just, it, you can't do that. Like, it's you just yeah, have yeah. to. And, and we've been struggling to find investors. And Germany is traditionally a sort of a more conservative uh, when it comes to investing. So it's just it's just been an uphill, uh, uphill battle to explain yeah. how the scalability cannot be translated to music tech in general or creative tech. Yeah, but I think if we just translate it, uh, just to make a, a closing remark, let's say, uh, if we compare all we discuss about like startups, because innovation is not a startup thing. This is for everyone at every level. Uh, I will quote or phrase whatever uh, a really interesting and I think smart uh, note from uh, Paul Pacifico. I, he, he was he made a, a kind of a keynote at uh, Slash, uh, comparing like the way to approach investing in startups with with investing in artists and talking about risk, the cycles, uh, the level of uncertain success. And it was like brilliant. Like just say, hey, we are talking potentially not about the same thing. It's all about comparison, but it's about taking risks and it's about trying to do uh, and to make it happen. And we don't know. So potentially, I'm not sure you know better, but uh, I, I hope you enjoyed. Oh, last last question for, and we we're done. So, uh, so, so uh, still a question for uh, Claudia, Ms. Claudia Schwartz. Uh, thank you for saying everything because uh, I'm a start startup co-founder in the music tech industry. And uh, what you said like really like uh, tickles me because nah, there is something about music, the music industry is that for VCs they are like, okay, it's not big enough. Okay, the market is stagnating. Everything, like all the issues that we are facing right now is much more because they don't see any evolution in the music markets. Even if, even if like there is innovation, even if anything like uh, is happening, it's very difficult to uh, convince a uh, VC with us saying like, yeah, but we could be in the, you know, like in the data market, we could be in uh, the over industry markets. So what is like um, your point of view about the evolution of music and how, as you said, like you have investors, how did you convince them like to say, yes, we are in the music industry and we are going for it because you know what, music, that's what we want to do. Um, well, I'm not sure I understood your question correctly, but I think there's there's plenty of evolution that we're seeing. I mean, just I mean, I can. So Germany is a, a rather peculiar market. We're still at 32 percent physical, which is just ridiculous. But you know, that's what it is. So it's I think that evolution. When you look at, and I don't have to tell you probably about the Asian market, but it's just so different, like how people use uh, consume music, discover music in different territories, and you know how they pay for music, for instance, in the, on the African continent is so different from what we, how we do it in, uh, in the European uh, market. So Claudia? I think there's there's what's that? We need to wrap this up. Oh yes, I do. So, sorry. I, 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 I <laughs> yeah. So I think there's, you, there's a you, clear you, you catch up. view just of evolution there. Towards. Just say to them that smart speakers' usage, first one is music. Okay. Adoption of uh, telcos, uh, bundle music is coming first. There is many blockchain. Music is one of the first uh, field of experimentation. There is many ways to explain it, even if it, um, it will not save your pitch, but try. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for the, the speakers. And uh, stay tuned.